Hey, Christophe, checking the sound. Do you hear me, Christophe? Yes. I'm okay, good. Good, hello. Excuse me. I hate to speak in the void. You heard me? Okay. I'm sorry? You heard me? Yeah, 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 I'm hearing you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to share. Uh, hey, I can't share. I can share. No, I can. I can share. Okay. Share. Okay. Up. Oops. It's okay. Good. Good. Excellent. So when I'm sharing, I don't see my screen anymore. Um, do you see any, how many people there are in the, in the conference? Yes, one people for a moment. One person? Yes. Hi. Hello? Okay, one more minute to go and we'll start. <clears throat> I'm ensuring just to see 11 people. Okay, that's good. Uh, your presentation is uh, 12 people. Okay, it's about time. I don't see you. 15 seconds. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I don't uh, see your presentation. Yeah, because I, I stopped sharing. Ah, okay. Uh, now I'm starting. Okay. Okay, you see it? Yes. Okay. Nice. Good. So I guess it's time. Uh, let's start. Okay. Hello everyone. So I am Raphael Monfredi and I'm here today with uh, Christophe Boursier. Yeah, hello. So Christophe uh, is a trainer at uh, Hair Technology and uh, myself, uh, I am um, also a trainer at uh, Her Head occasionally and I also my, uh, my own consulting uh, firm um, where I, um, I provide DevOps consulting to, uh, to companies to help them transform their business towards DevOps. And today I'm here to um, to talk about uh, this um, uh, ability to bring API culture to DevOps teams. So this is the agenda for today. I don't, I'm not sure we will have time to, uh, to show the, the examples, and basically screenshots at the end. So the idea is to start exploring API types, um, look at the view of programs as uh, an API actually, and why DevOps loves API. So let's start from with definitions that uh, we can start, uh, we can find on, on Wikipedia, an interface, a shared boundary across two or more separate components. An application programming interface is a computing interface which defines interaction between several multiple software intermediaries. And so this is uh, obvious, obviously, for the people who are here today. Um, now, DevOps, maybe uh, some people do not know about DevOps. So uh, our definition for today uh, is that a DevOps team is a cross-functional value chain uh, made of people who share a uh, business objective and uh, whose aim it is to, to create constantly new business value uh, without sacrificing quality. Um, I guess that will do for, for today. So before we, we start uh, into this presentation, a word of two uh, of caution, actually. Um, this presentation is not deeply technical. It's, it's an overview, of course, and so we are doing, making some simplifications uh, so to not um, uh, include too many low-level details, but everything we say is going to be correct. 
we just want to, you to feel uh, the power of APIs uh, and uh, why they matter for your business and your teams and your DevOps teams. So let's uh, look into uh, the various API types. Um, so I, I have made three uh, high-level distinction between uh, all these uh, APIs that we know today. Um, the first I see is the basic one with operating system, the system calls. When you have interaction within your program, and this is the library code that you're making, and for the purpose of this talk, we, we call everything a function, be it a, a procedure, a feature call, a method call, whatever. We say everything is a function, and as such, it takes zero or more parameters, and it maybe <coughs> returns the result. And of course, these functions are mathematical functions, since they have side effects. They can have side effects. And across programs, the third category is that we can perform remote calls. So remote here doesn't mean that it's um, it's a remote machine, it can be a local machine, but it's a remote process at least. Uh, so system calls. What is a system call? A system call is basically what everybody, everybody every process <clears throat> is doing when it interacts with uh, an operating system. And when you make a, a system call, uh, like write, for instance, write some data uh, on, uh, on a file descriptor. What happens is basically you enter a stub, and this stub lets you trap into a kernel. And in a kernel, your, your CPU is running in privilege mode, and um, some very, very specific code is running to dispatch your system code. So here, this is uh, the syswrite function. And when the function is done, we return to the user space. So this separation between CPU uh, in user mode and privilege mode is key for the kernel to protect itself. So we have a clear separation of concerns uh, and memory isolation due to this hardware barrier. The system maintains its integrity because the only thing it offers is the user services and each service, each system call, has a well-defined contract. So the input is validated when you enter a system call the semantic of the call is precisely known, and of course, the output is cleaned up by the kernel to avoid leakage of information from kernel space to user space because the kernel sees all the processes, and there could be some security issues if he didn't do that. The only access to the system is for system calls. You have no choice. So a word uh, on general design uh, architectural uh, concern for APIs, not necessarily uh, for system calls, but I'm taking this as an example here. There's not a unique API, even if you want to define a standard operation. And I will demonstrate that uh, in a moment. An API reflects a high level concern, a global system architecture. The API is meant for programmers. Okay, So we have to think about the programmers, how they're going to use our, our API when we program. And um, the API, of course, is hiding the implementation of the, uh, the function itself. This is called information hiding. We don't know how it's implemented. And the, it offers us some constructs, some abstractions that we're going to manipulate through the API. But these, these constructs are opaque to us. We, we can only manipulate them through the API, and this is called the encapsulation. So example of system concept that you will be familiar with, memory, files, processes, users, etc. So just to take an example on this API uh, design thing, let's compare a process creation on Windows. So on Windows, we have the system calls, called create process, uh, with, uh, you see, a, a complex signature. Uh, it has 10 parameters. Um, the function name is create process, and it returns a Boolean. And on Unix, uh, the uh, system code to create a process is very simple. It's fork. And it has no parameters, and it uh, returns uh, only one value, the child process number. So for, for this example, we see that uh, different signatures, different semantics demonstrate different architectural choice from the people who design the system. So we, your design choice will show in your API. Right? Library calls. Library calls, they are very simple. It's a function call that you do, but you don't write the code. So you just write the call to this code. So here, for instance, you call malloc to allocate memory in C, you call the malloc function. You invoke a method match on a regular expression object, you call the match method uh, 
actually a, a feature call in, in the class. That's very simple. So we have the same concepts here as with system calls, but we have two important differences. There is no hardware and force barriers. So um, we share the same address space and this can cause problems because there's no isolation. The only isolation we can have between the implementation and the user side, I would say, is the language semantics. The benefits of library calls, abstracting uh, implementation be behind libraries, uh, is that we have information hiding, encapsulation, of course, like system calls, but we have also reusability because um, bah, you're not uh, necessarily uh, um, going to implement tomorrow a, a good quick sort routine or a good regular expression engine. You're going to rely on library routines to do that. The code you don't write, you don't have to maintain it. So it's good for, uh, for your, uh, your software to reuse um, other stuff. It provides readability. When you have a well-known API, everybody understands what the function call is doing. So it makes your program shorter and easier to read. And of course, uh, correctness, because hopefully uh, this code is used, used by much more uh, people than uh, people in your company. Uh, and so there it's more tested. And it's probably took the time to select a, a correct algorithm, etc. Et so we have many benefits to using libraries. But libraries, they also open the door to possible security problems because you import the code basically in your executable, when you bind to a library, you also import their security problems if they, if they do have some. Now, the last class I was mentioning about uh, during my introduction was remote calls. Remote calls, well, this brings another level of complexity because uh, we have we have more pieces that are moving. We have a, a client, the server, and possibly many clients. Uh, we have some limitations. Um, we have some interoperability concerns, possibly. We have a network, so a network is not reliable. A network can be uh, spied, okay? So we need some security, we need some authentication. So being remote means more, more complexity for our application. So how does uh, a remote call uh, operate? Basically, it's always the same. We have a function that we want to call remotely. We serialize the parameters. So here we have two parameters, A and B. So we construct this message, uh, this packet. Uh, we say that we want to call function F, and then we transport that to the other side, where we deserialize the packet. We see, ah, we are calling F. F has two parameters, A and B. I'm calling F. I'm providing, it provides a result that I'm serializing back to the calling side, where it's deserialized to give the assignment to X. So we pay two transport latencies back and forth, and we have the serialization and deserialization costs on both sides. But that's not it. Uh, that's not all the concern we have. We also have some um, possible faults on the remote side, some network errors that can happen at any time. So we need to, to prepare for these errors and these remote execution faults, and also protocol errors people sending us garbage, or we get garbage back from the server. So we, we must protect from that. And so we need some error handling on our calling side. There's also the extensibility problem, okay? The function on the server takes another parameter C, but we don't know about it. Or we want to send a new parameter C, but the server is not ready to accept it. Or perhaps, we change the type of A. So now the serialization of A is different than what the server is going to expect. Or the result, it's now a list, for instance, instead of a, just a single value. So how do we manage these changes to the API? Addition of arguments, new types, etc. This is a concern. And how do we know that there is a problem occurring when there is a problem? And finally, uh, we have also this language barrier. Uh, we can have a, a client in Java, a server in C, for instance. So how do we have these two different languages who may have uh, different representation of data types interact? Uh, the serialization must be compatible. And where do we find the server? How do we know which server to, 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 to call? 
So these are the problems of remote calls. Uh, but also we have benefits, of course. Uh, these benefits are that because we have different processes, we restore this uh, barrier between the implementation and the user. Comparable to what we had for system calls, we are able to share the implementation of the function without importing it in our code. Okay? And this is called the client-server paradigm, of course, uh, as you know. Um, this allows us to scale the processing of the function. If on the server side, we distribute the various requests to various processors, we achieve load balancing. And we can also make the remote calls asynchronous, not wait for the answer. And so we achieve massive parallelism and exploitation of remote CPU time. So obviously, these benefits must outweigh the costs, because otherwise, we will never do remote calls. And we do, actually. So another interesting subclass of um, remote calls uh, exists. And this is a subclass which alleviates most of the concerns we detailed earlier. Namely, we can have client language independence. The uh, API signature can be flexible. We can have the notion of optional parameters. We can vary the, the types of parameters, possibly also. And um, we know how to find the server. And also, we can cache some of the responses. Now, you know where I'm getting at this important subclass of remote calls is what we call web calls. So web calls, what is it? We are defining a web call as a remote call bearing this characteristic. Web call is going to use an exchange protocol between the client and the server, which is HTTP. Both parties can leverage the caching semantics. Okay, so it's not just a transport layer. Um, client and server can negotiate the content type. So we can, I can ask for text, I can ask for HTML, XML, JSON, okay? And I can also name my arguments uh, to the server. So I can have the notion of optional argument, I can uh, perhaps send an extra argument that the server will ignore, but that's okay. And the server can be a facet, like an API gateway. And this is completely transparent to the client. It must not matter. It should not matter for the client. And finally, these web calls, there is another, another tiny subclass, which is called REST. REST um, means representational, representational state transfer. Very easy to pronounce. And we have this RESTful property. Uh, it's an architectural property, actually, uh, which uh, defines a set of constraints on our application. The server must be stateless. It does not remember any of the client state. The client will manipulate only resources defined through well-defined HTTP methods. So these methods are get, right? the hidden potent method, read-only, we get a resource to retrieve a representation. There's no side effect. Post, we create a new resource. Of course, side effect. Uh, and we get the new resource back. Put and patch to update a part of the resource or the old resource and delete to destroy the resource. Resources that we manipulate are represented via uh, a mechanism called uh, URI, Uniform Resource Identifier. And client and server, this is a very important uh, last point, client and server rely on hypermedia to drive our interactions. So I just know the entry point and later interaction is driven through links, just like when you open a web page and uh, you follow links in this web page, you don't know where these uh, links are going to bring you, but you know that you can follow them. Same thing for REST applications. So contrary to other attempts to use HTTP for remote calls that we had in the past, like uh, XML, RPC, SOAP, etc. Here, we can really leverage the existing web infrastructure and its semantics. So we really send hypertext. We leverage the cache infrastructure. This allows us to decouple um, services. For instance, a service which will not be able, av available downstream, it's OK. We are going to use a cached representation of a resource if we already have one, for instance. We are at liberty to select suitable extensible representations, so XML, JSON, etc. 
and still preserve this flexibility of interface that we want. There's no need for middle, middleware, sorry, um, to distribute the application. The web is already equipped for that. And we can easily um, use uh, protocols for credential or OAuth 2.0, for instance, which were specifically designed for HTTP to be able to handle these web calls. So this is our final uh, uh, taxonomy uh, on uh, all the calls. So we have a system for at the bottom, library calls, remote calls, and then a sub, a really, really, really small part of these calls are actually REST calls. And today we're going to focus mostly on, uh, on web calls and REST calls. So programs can also be viewed as an API. How? Well, through what we call a command line interface. A command line interface, it's a process that allows us to enter commands as text to a processor, which usually is named shell. And we can view this command line interface from the function viewpoint. A command, it's just a high level function call. It has parameters, it executes a processing, and it outputs a result. And we can also have composition behind, that is to say the shell command can uh, use one or uh, other lower level functions to create its output. So for instance, simple command, date, okay? If I type date on my, on my uh, terminal, I get the date, okay? And so I have the command prompt, the command, and the output, okay? And this command is basically, has a lot of stuff, but basically it's a, it's a wrapper on two uh, C library uh, function, local time to get the system time, and Esther have time to uh, format the time. But date has also arguments. So you can use it to parse, you know, symbolic expression about dates and compute the date next week plus two months, for instance. Easy. And we can also launch web calls from a shell. This is very powerful. So for instance, if I have a, a shell variable called MMAPI, so basically this is a Mattermost implementation that I'm running at home, um, and I do this command, I get a result. So I'm actually invoking an API on Mattermost called Teams slash name. This is the, the, the name of the API I'm calling, and the parameter here is days. And I get, um, I get some JSON output, which supplies us representation of uh, within Mattermost of this resource. Uh, so this team has a display name, for instance, which is called which is API Days, and it has a, a very nice ID internal to Mattermost. So this command, basically, uh, that I, I showed in the previous uh, previous screen, is a get method on the URI which is given here. And Mattermost returns us the representation for that resource. This is how I achieve a web call. And if I just want a specific uh, parameter, you know, in, in, the, in the representation and not the whole representation, I can say something like this in the shell, and this magic command will return me um, just the ID. And then, I can use that to compose and call another API. For instance, imagine, so this is Mattermost. Mattermost is the equivalent of, of uh, Slack. Uh, and you, 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 you can use commands in, in, in the chat with, at begin with slash, and you can define your own commands. So perhaps this team, days, API days, has defined some special slash commands. Okay, let's, let's ask Mattermost. So we invoke a command, sorry, an API uh, called commands, we pass it two parameters, the team ID and a flag saying, basically, I just want the custom uh, slash commands. And then I filter just to have the triggers, and then I get three results. So I know that this team has defined three commands. And I, if I'm doing this uh, you know, many times, I can write uh, a small shell command um, program, huh, basically, which will encapsulate everything and allow me to, uh, you know, have a, a nicer API for my daily use. Instead of this cumbersome curl command, I just say mm commands, days, and it gives me the three uh, specific shell commands, that, uh, sorry, slash commands that I have defined 
on this implementation, on this team. So, for instance, this slash lab2 command, uh, if I type in, uh, in uh, Mattermost uh, this uh, sequence, okay, and remember from the previous slide, slash lab2 is really posting to an echo service. This is how I define lab slash lab2 on, on my uh, Mattermost implementation. I get this. Uh, obscure, of course, but this is basically echoing the body request that it gets. And I have everything here. I have um, in this um, text arguments, I have my arguments. Uh, so they are very well encoded, of course. We have an URL for responding, which is the response URL here. Uh, so I can post back to this channel um, with the token I have here, um, a reply, an asynchronous reply if I want. Basically, what I get here for this simple API, I have a basis for remote integration. I can write a boot, for instance, that will answer to my uh, slash lab2 command or another command, uh, processing my arguments and sending back a result. This is a very powerful way to extend the chat program given by Matos, that interface. So we can rely on this API to compose new functions that in turn will become pieces on which we will write new functions. That's the essence of programming. And all the enterprise-grade pro, uh, pro software that we, we are using today, they, they have these APIs and they allow us to, um, to bypass the, the, the graphical user interface, which is you know, a human process, to be able to automate the interaction with a program. And this allows us to treat this um, in interaction we have as code, meaning we, we manage this as we manage any other code interface, uh, artifact. So we version control it, we can have it reviewed, we can share it with others to you know, help them achieve something that we were not thinking about before. So now that we have covered the APIs, what they are, how to use them, why would DevOps teams love API? Why DevOps loves API today? So what is DevOps? Perhaps not, uh, not everyone here is familiar with DevOps. So I'm giving you high level, uh, you know, uh, codes that represent what DevOps could mean. Uh, so create customer value permanently, for instance. Extend agile software development practices to production. Deliver reliable software application faster. And this famous code from Werner Vogel, you will it, you earn it. But basically, DevOps is about creating a culture that is going to foster collaboration among the whole value chain to continually produce business value. And DevOps has these um, three ways. Uh, three ways that uh, they, 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 they come from a book called The Phoenix Project from uh, Jen Kim. And they define basically the three directions that DevOps emphasizes. Uh, so the first one is the flow, the flow of work from dev to ops that we want to maximize. And we want to it to be as smooth and as steady as possible. So each step in our production pipeline, uh, the, 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 the automation that bring us, uh, you know, the, the code that we develop into production, we want this to be um, triggered completely automatically with minimum human overhead. The feedback is the reverse flow. So it's some um, information that comes back from ops to dev. And we want this uh, feedback loops to be as short as possible. Because if we have feedback, usually, so if it's good feedback, it's good to know. If it's bad feedback, it's probably something we want to act upon. And so we want this information quickly for diagnosis and for remediation. And the third way of DevOps is the ability to uh, to uh, give people time to explore new things, to innovate, and to share the discoveries they, 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 they find, they, they, they um, explore, and help others practice uh, their heart, basically. So how do we improve flow with APIs? If we look at a typical DevOps pipeline, 
And this comes from the, um, the book from Jason Bull, Continuous Delivery. Basically, a pipeline, a DevOps pipeline, basically is a sequence of you know, events like this, where uh, the team checks in new code, and then we have various steps that are uh, you know, triggered automatically to build, test, uh, and validate everything we do. And at the end of the pipeline, the, the little change we made is basically approved. It's all green, so it's ready for delivery. So we can inform, of course, the team that everything is okay, and we can possibly say to production, hey, we have a new package that perhaps we would want to move to production. And so this pipeline, of course, the execution of it must be completely automatic. Otherwise, we would hurt the flow. Uh, and this means that all the tools that we have in this, uh, this tool chain, um, we need APIs to trigger the next step. We need APIs to trigger back uh, some feedback when there is a problem. And we need APIs to collect metrics and distribute them. So the actions uh, that we perform in the DevOps pipeline, basically uh, through APIs, is the triggering of the pipeline itself, uh, hook uh, on the GitHub, GitLab, or whatever system you're using for your source code control. And then the provisioning infrastructure, the registration of artifacts in the repository, collection of metrics, etc. And last but not least, the uh, change request. At the end of the pipeline, we are going to want to move something to production. We need to have a change request. And we are going to automate the preparation of this change request, feed it manua uh, manually, sorry, automatically, not manually, precisely. Um, and uh, hopefully, it will be a, 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 a standard change request, so pre approved, and it will be able to go to production immediately. So, relying on manual steps in the pipeline will actually hurt the flow by creating a constraint. Every time a human needs to do something, we have the opportunity of errors. Uh, delay, etc. How do we improve feedback with APIs? Well, the, the aim here is to accelerate the notification process. Uh, something goes bad, goes bad in production or in a stage of the pipeline. What we need to do is act now, now, okay? Not tomorrow, now. So we need uh, a speedy notification, and we cannot use email for that, okay? Email is an asynchronous medium. You don't know when people will receive email or read it. We need something like chat ups, a chat mechanism with instantaneous messages. We want to make information available. Okay, We are getting feedback, something is wrong, something is not operating as expected. Let's perhaps proactively push information so that the diagnosis is easier. And let's collect that automatically and use APIs to push that to the chat ops platform. When there is an incident, well, we can uh, you know, notify uh, chat ops also to say, hey, there's an incident, and here's some context about it. And all the information that is exchanged on the, on the chat platform to, you know, between dev and ops, all of the, any people uh, involved in the, in the incident is, of, of course, um, collectible from the, from the platform and can be automatically fed back to ITSM systems for logging in these systems. So basically, these APIs let machines and humans collaborate. Monitoring is also a source of feedback. Um, when you have a system in production, an application, it is monitoring, right? You're not going to, to put that without uh, looking at it. Um, it would be insane. But monitoring is not just doing health checks. Monitoring requires also some information gathering on the applications. And we should offer APIs in our system to help this. Collect this information and then perhaps use other APIs to feed it to a machine learning system to be able to identify failure patterns, to identify uh, security attacks, find bottlenecks, etc. And embedding uh, monitoring APIs in application is really different from having application log an event. And the example I'm taking here is this uh, smart uh, technology, which is embedded in all the disks that we, we, we have in our machines. Okay, We can tell smart, well, just launch a test and it will do that. Or we can ask smart, how many bad sectors do I have on my disk? How long until it fails? Is it healthy? And we do that 
independently of the operating system, but directly talking to the disk. And we can also have perhaps APIs for experimentation and learning, which is the third way of DevOps. Oh, yeah, there are APIs. And um, as far as learning is concerned, the first one, I'm sure you all know it. It's a famous human-friendly, very human-friendly API, web API, called Wikipedia. And if you want a machine to learn, well, there's also a, a, a KRS, the KRS API on, on top of TensorFlow, okay, to, to help you train your, your machine learning application. And for experimenting, well, we are surrounded by APIs. And we can even invent our new APIs by experiment, full experimentation. So DevOps, I really love APIs, right? So from a developer standpoint, what happens? Well, a developer spends all his professional life and perhaps part of his personal life is he's doing uh, uh, open source software um, with APIs. So we've seen system calls, library calls, remote calls, everything, shared commands. This is the, 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 the daily, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, objects, I would say, uh, daily, um, uh, you know, life of, of a developer. And these APIs, they're combined to create new programs, new functionality. And developers, they also have some design, uh, you know, uh, design activities on APIs. They, they're not just designing their application, they're also designing APIs, internal or perhaps external when they are, they are building a server, for instance. Uh, and this is an art. This is something which has, uh, you know, uh, Personal, you put something of you when you design an API, your experience, your belief, your whatever. So there's an artistic dimension into creating an API. And developers can also create facade APIs. So a facade API basically is a high level API that is going to, um, um, you know, provide higher level abstractions on lower level things. Uh, for instance, think about sockets. Okay, sockets in uh, in our uh, in our uh, um, operating systems they, they abstract the TCP and UDP uh, layers for us. It's very convenient. Uh, or you can have also common APIs um, to uh, ensure portability. For instance, we have this famous JTK toolkit, graphical toolkit, uh, which allows us to have uh, application run uh, with the same source code both on Linux, for instance, and on Windows. So developers, they love API by design, I would say. But from an upstand standpoint, it's less clear. Um, what operations do, they ensure systems work as they should. So they don't necessarily use APIs today. Um, they, they, they use certainly a common line interface, but they're not perhaps not completely into the API mindset yet. But as they collaborate more with developers, and remember, developers are going to put to design and prepare things that will end up being you know, managed by operations. So it's a good thing to collaborate with them to avoid getting systems that we cannot monitor, that we cannot operate, that are you know, brittle, um, very fragile. Um, modern systems also, you know, we have, we have this, um, with silver bullets. Uh, my application is cloud native. I'm using microservices. Wow, great. And these things, they are deeply connected to APIs. And so um, as ops, we, we need to understand these APIs to be able to um, manage them. Also concepts like infrastructure as code, immutable infrastructure, containerization, these things are there to, to stay, I would say. Uh, these approaches are new, but they're here for good. And um, the APIs, they, they rely on APIs. So the, these things, through these things, ops are going to be really um, close to, uh, you know, APIs. And also the operation automation. Remember Google, uh, Google they published a book called Site Rebuild Engineering, where basically they answer this question, what happens when we put software engineers in charge of operations? And it works. Um, 
and also we saw chat ups, which is the integration of chat um, across the whole value chain with automation on it to help collect information and publish information. So operations are about to become API lovers by necessity. So as a conclusion to this, uh, this uh, short presentation, um, one of the DevOps tenets is really the efficiency of the value chain. What we want is constant creation of value without um, you know, um, spending time doing um, uh, things that are not bringing value, basically. So uh, we call them waste, okay? And we don't want to do wasteful things. We want to do creative things. We want to spend our time doing things that create value. And by automation, through APIs, we buy ourselves the time to be able to do this. And um, this automation is going to, to bring us uh, three things. The speed of execution, because an automated program will always perform faster than a human if it's well written. Coherence, that is to say, if I execute my program many times, it would do the same things. There's less deviations compared to human execution. And we have also documentation. The program is a working specification. And since everyone now knows how to read programs, well, this is our documentation. So APIs are everywhere. And this is just the beginning. So we better prepare for it. So basically, uh, this is um, what I wanted to present you today. And I have just uh, extra um, you know, slides to just demonstrate basically very quickly um, how these APIs are you know, used in practice. Um, and I, I've taken a very small, um, uh, very small use case, which is basically the integration of uh, uh, a GitLab instance with Mattermost. So here what happened, for instance, when uh, I submit, uh, someone submits code in a project. Uh, so this is a Mattermost uh, window. Um, and we see, you know, a, a boat uh, pushing information about someone making changes. And each of these things you can see in blue, they are hyperlinks that enable me to, by clicking to, on them, see what happened. And so, for instance, if I want to click on this pipeline, uh, what's this pipeline 12 here? It passed, but what did it do? I have to click there, and it brings me to uh, GitHub. Oh, sorry, GitLab here. Um, and uh, on this instance, I see uh, the, the job, uh, sorry, the pipeline job, and I have to click on jobs here to get to the job. And if I want to see what happened, I need to click here. And then, finally, I see the log of the, uh, the execution of my pipeline. You see a lot of clicks. Uh, so I have information, but a lot of clicks. I could automate this. Could automate this, and I did it uh, as an example. So I created a very simple command, um, GitLab job log. So I give it the uh, job number, and then it gives me uh, the same output as uh, we saw on the screen. But here, it's on my terminal. I can pipe it to another program to grab it, you know, to do whatever I, I can with, uh, I want with this, uh, this log. I can manipulate it. It's an object for me now. And this command, very simple, this uh, gijob log command, very simple, you see, so few line of, uh, of shell script. Basically, it's, it's a call to an API on GitLab to, uh, you know, uh, variables are in, um, in magenta here, and we, we get uh, a trace of a job. Very simple. And that's it for my presentation. So let me go back to the uh, main window. Oops. Click the wrong button. So we have, uh, I think we have uh, some time for questions. That's great. I don't know the interface to get questions, by the way. Uh, I have a chat, yes. So let me unshare first because uh, this is going to create problems if I don't. Okay. Um, why is the chat? A chat. Yeah. Do we have questions?
I guess um, everyone was uh, stunned by the speed of my presentation. <laughs> I had a lot of material to cover. I was not sure I would, I would be able to finish in time. So um, I had to, uh, to speed up a little bit. So do I know an alternative open source for pager duty? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I don't know any open source documentation for that. Yes, it takes time to think about a question and type it. So I think we have until um, until uh, 20, right? So we have seven more minutes. Um, so we have a question here. What are limitations and where to use API facade? Um, so facade basically is um, when you create an higher level uh, abstraction on top of things. So, for instance, if you look at um, uh, the toolkit, let's take this example of a graphical toolkit. Uh, uh, GIMP, we created the CTK toolkit, graphical toolkit. And of course, this is done on top of the X11 library. Uh, at first, it was done there. Um, I don't know if you ever program with X11, but it's, it's a mess. <laughs> uh, it's not something you want to do. But um, uh, by uh, you know creating a higher level abstraction like uh, JTK did, and many of our toolkit do the same thing. Uh, I'm just no, uh, talking about this, this one because I know it. Uh, but it's it's really easy to create things to to have a working application very quickly. Um, and so uh, using an API facade for 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 so here we're talking about library calls. Huh? It, it's bringing power to expressive expressive power to people. If you are talking about um, you know having a facade on top of um, uh, over APIs like web APIs, well, this is exactly what I did with my uh, my little shell script here in this presentation. My shell scripts are basically a facade, and behind I have uh, the uh, I'm doing the real API calls, okay, and the aim is to simplify the interface that I'm giving to to to, to a user. Um, is this answering your question? So it was a question for Marwan from Marwan. Did I answer your question? I have another question here from Jerome. Uh, is your slide deck available somewhere for download? I yes, I think they will be made available by uh, by the organizer. I I don't know how exactly, but um, this video was taped, so this presentation you will be able to see it again. Um, and the slide probably yes, there, there's a mechanism to um, to to get them. If you want to get them desperately, uh, you have my email um, on the, on the presentation. Uh, so let me let me show you back this uh, first slide. Uh, so you have my email, and you you can write me, and I, my my pleasure to to send you a, a copy of the slides. So let me let me share back this. Just a minute. Uh, share screen. Okay, there you go. Okay, let me quickly unshare so that I can look at other questions. It's a complex topic, so um, I understand it's difficult to also come up with simple questions that we can answer in uh, in four minutes, or three minutes. Ah, uh, very long question. <laughs> um, very common example of business impact is Walgreens, a uh, store chain in the US, which increased revenue by six, by a factor of six for customers using partner services and then coming into physical stores and buying more stuff. 
Do you know examples in France of APIs having major business impacts? Tough question. <laughs> Tough question. Um, I um, I can say that I heard yesterday uh, we we had uh, we had um, a small meetup, a virtual meetup with people with speakers actually. And I met someone very, very interesting. So let me, um, I don't remember his name. He's a CTO of uh, BPI. Uh, so BPI is a French investment bank. Um, and um, he's giving a talk uh, during API days, huh, obviously. And he was telling me that um, he designed uh, recently uh, a new set of APIs that really helped BPI, you know, um, in this tense economical um, uh, time that we have due to COVID, um, basically he said, yeah, with these APIs, we, we're saving businesses. So I, I cannot say it has the same impact as uh, Walgreens, which I don't know. But yes, I'm, I'm sure API, public APIs like this are helping businesses, are helping people be more efficient. That's for sure. And we have someone saying in the, in the chat uh, that uh, in the insurance business, there is also uh, a, a number of API uh, Wacom, uh, which is uh, formerly known as La Parisienne Assurance. They, they, have, this, um, they have this API uh, powered business. Uh, Renault, okay, you see, <laughs> there are many examples. You just have to look around. I'm sure that um, Everybody is going to say, yeah, API are saving my business. And, you know, I, I could answer also this um, without knowing uh, anything about them, but people like sites, websites like Amazon, like, um, you know, um, uh, Amadeus, um, who are, who are uh, you know, the ticket reservation system, um, booking.com. I'm sure we have APIs everywhere to automate the processing. Now, internally, I don't know if they expose APIs to, to end users, or expose the website, but I, I don't know if they expose APIs to partners, for instance. Probably. Probably. Yeah. So the, the issue with all these APIs, uh, as you, you probably guessed uh, from my talk, is uh, the issue of design. It's difficult to to design a, a good API, and then it's difficult to have it evolve and keep it stable, uh, backward compatible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are the challenges of uh, this is an engineering challenge, actually, not a technical one. And final question, I guess, because it's time. Uh, great presentation. Do you have? Thank you. Do you have any opinion on how APIs can be managed for better discoverability in or across large organizations? I do. <laughs> I do, but. Um, it would take a, a, a long time for me to answer that. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have time to answer that. But yes, um, um, for instance, uh, just uh, first thing that comes to mind is, um, uh, you know, I was talking about hypermedia behind APIs. Um, well, when you have catalog, for instance, in, in a company and um, you, you, you you're selling things and you have a catalog and this catalog is updated, um, well, I'm sure that you have um, your clients using this catalog to, you know, sell things or, or handle this thing, price of things, they probably have a mechanism to sync back to the catalog to know if something changed. And it's probably the case that they are using uh, Atom, uh, you know, Atom Publishing or Atom, uh, you know, syndication to get changes from this uh, central authority. Uh, but no, it's just the first thing that comes to mind. And I, I have other examples, but um, longer to, to develop. I'm sorry. It's too short. And unfortunately, because it's a remote event, we cannot meet afterwards to, 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 have, uh, to have a chat uh, about that. I'm sorry, Charles. Well, thank you. I guess it's time to, um, to end this, uh, this meeting. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your nice comments. And um, have a nice evening. See you next year, perhaps. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Christophe. Bye, Raphael, thank you very much.